So, for example, uh, uh, Saint Francis of Assisi, he was born uh, as the son of a very fairly wealthy merchant in Italy, and he was so disgusted by by his father's wealth and consumption, and that he did. Told, uh, was, there were very few spiritual who rejected all material things so completely. He was the ultimate hippie before uh, hippies. So he didn't, he would always go barefoot, have no possessions whatsoever. I don't want anything, no nothing material. And so he, and many people joined him, young, young men, often some women, they, they joined him and wanted to live like him. It seemed a wonderful thing. And then gradually his teaching spread, and more people joined the order. And then they had to come to the church was becoming suspicious. He had to go and visit the Pope and ask to be, have permission to have an order, and so on. And he had to do that. There's a wonderful scene in a movie, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, where St. Francis visits the Pope. It's a beautiful scene. and. Uh, then, as the as the movement grew, the the and Saint Francis, Francis got, got older. The order started to, to have possessions. They they had beginning to have buildings and lands, and he was so disgusted by this. He didn't want to have much to do with. He he let let other people run it. I don't want it anymore. He didn't like. But if that had not happened. The entire Franciscan moon would have evaporated after his death. It needed to be somehow rooted in the materiality, the physicality of things. Jesus lived by, was supported by women mostly, strangely enough. But many people don't know that. And it's all, only said in one line in the New Testament where many women followed him and served him with their possessions, with their money. So, if you and then how would a, some, let's say, a, um, a, a publication, a Western publication where Jesus lived nowadays, a Western publication would say, he's exploiting this, look at this spiritual teacher, he's exploiting these women, he's taking all their money. This would be the headline if they. Uh, They've, some of them have left, left their families, and she's just a dreadful charlatan. Look, look what he's doing. So there's no clear, everybody has to decide for themselves what they feel comfortable with. If you are a spiritual teacher, what is it that you feel comfortable with? Do you charge? Do you say donation? Whatever you do, somehow you need some money. And if you go to a spiritual teaching also, you can see, do you feel comfortable with paying something or not? If you don't feel comfortable, go somewhere else where you don't pay. You can go to a Buddhist monastery for, and for a while you don't pay. If you go there a few times, they're going to look at you and say, well, where's your donation? <laughs> You're, I mean, you need, it wouldn't make, uh, so, but, there was a time when after my shift in consciousness, when I explored, uh, I had this need to explore all kinds of spiritual traditions. And I, I went, I tried everything because I didn't understand what had happened to me. I eventually the understanding came through Buddhist teachings and then I understood, oh, this is what it is about. It's a cessation of thinking. When the Buddhist a Zen monk said to me, well, Zen is about not thinking. And I said, that was a revelation to me, not thinking. And then I realized that I was doing very little thinking. But I only experienced the not thinking as inner peace. I didn't know it was not thinking. But anyway, I explored other things, cause in miracles. There were workshops. I went to, wanted to know what's the cause in miracles. I read, in, very interesting. I went into I went to Scientology. I, want, I did never became a member. I did one test. I just wanted to, but, but they were so. The guy who was doing it was so stupid that I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't even want to know his interpretation of my test. 
but I, then I went to other workshops. There were some workshops charged money, and occasionally I was so interested that, okay, this one charge is 500 pounds for the weekend. Well, I don't have 500 pounds. Then I remember, okay, I need to get a job. I need to make, I was really interested. I can't remember what it was. There are so many things. I need 500 pounds. Okay, I, I remember what job I got to get the 500 pounds for two weeks. I got a job at the Kennel Club in London, registering dogs on little <laughs> little cards. What's the name of the dog? They were all coming in, every day they were coming in. <laughs> I had to open the envelope, register breed, name, age, gender, or call, there were no computers then. Okay, and after two weeks I had enough money to join the workshop. It wasn't very good, but at least... <laughs> <laughs> but at least I knew that wasn't for me, and uh, I never, I never felt, oh, these people are terrible. If they want that money and people do it, perhaps it's worth it. Perhaps it's a wonderful thing. It happened not to be a wonderful thing, but uh, so uh, generally speaking, you are very right. Money can make people very unconscious, even just some people even just beginning to talk about money, uh, especially, especially people who have had an experience of scarcity in their childhood and whose parents were fearful around money and money was always discussed in their family with negative emotions. There was never enough and so on. Uh, so I know I've met people who were relatively conscious in most of their lives, except the moment when money was mentioned then immediately it pulled them into unconscious reactivity. And not just necessarily huge amounts of money, it could just be, he charged me too much, was $10 too much. The entire bill was 200 but it was the $10, it's terrible. Uh, so very, just mention money and they become unconscious. Um, in, for some people, other, there are other triggers that still make it. There may be some of you have certain triggers that make you unconscious. Whenever you think about it or talk about it, it could be, for example, your ex-spouse. <laughs> Whenever you think or talk about him or her, you go, oh, awful. <laughs> or it could be money, or it could be something else, some other, your pet subject that you feel something in politics that the moment it's mentioned you go react become reactive but for many people it's money so you need to observe that money is only you one could see symbolic energy it symbolizes energy and in itself is not problematic but for many people it becomes associated with fear of the fear of not enough and also Ego, it becomes associated with ego. So how much money you have determines your worth. How much, are you, this is a weird expression, how much is he worth? That's ridiculous. Uh, uh, so what's your relationship with money? It's, it's one which has evolved over time and now it's a place where I see it as symbolic energy and that's what I'm going and teaching the world about. Yeah. Yeah, good. That's good. Um, I'm doing good with the money. Not everybody, almost nobody knows what exactly I do with it. I feel like uh, Jesus' uh, advice when you give something, don't to let the left hand know what the right hand is doing or something like that. So nobody knows because you can so easily become ego. I met some somebody last year lovely, wonderful man, he's, he's doing, doing such good in the world, and he's very wealthy, but uh, he's not here, so I'm just saying it. <laughs> uh, maybe he probably won't even know I'm referring to him, but, uh, but soon after meeting him, he gave me a list, he pronounced, well, I'm engaged in the following charities. This one, I've been supporting this charity for 15 years, and this is what is. Then I'm I'm supporting this, and then I created that charity, and that it's wonderful work. But I could see he was already spiritually awakening, but his ego was uh, 
build, uh, clinging to his charities. So he's doing good, but it's, it's not doing him much good, not his ego. Uh, so it's better to give uh, anonymously, as I often do, to give anonymously. People don't even know where it's coming from. <laughs> it's a lovely way of giving.